to do a, um, also some comments on what uh, Martin told. You have learned the word bias from the media, from the daily life. Bias means to have some kind of prejudice. Yes, you have an explanation for something that is um, perhaps strongly simplified. This, this in interpretation of bias, this understanding for bias, and the bias that Martin was talking about is similar to the same. They have the same background. This is more or less the same bias. Machine learning means we try to explain the world and we consider a certain kind of functions, these uh, um, value pairs in, in find S and uh, these uh, simple value pairs in find S. In candidate elimination are such explanations. And the simpler such an explanation is the more you are biased. Uh, if you want to um, say it, uh, you, you can apply this to everything of the real world you know. Yeah? If, if you want to talk about furniture, you might say a chair, everything which, which has uh, four legs is a chair. Then you have a very simple rule to for the understanding of uh, this furniture and this, the, the simplicity of the understanding is called bias. However, you cannot make the explanation of the concept more complex and more complex and more complex because you have to train, you have to specify to, to make it concrete your function with which you explain the data. And there's a trade off we will learn later on, not today, the so called bias variance. Dilemma, dilemma it's called, but it's more a trade off. And depending on the data and the amount of data, you have to understand how complex or how biased your hypothesis should be. And this is very important to understand this. And um, Mitchell, Tom Mitchell, which we follow here in his explanations, uses the concept learning because it's not so complex a learning problem, but we can learn all important aspects of machine learning regarding to hypothesis search. Okay. What now comes is um, a, um, uh, centered around the question, how good are we in fact? And let's say you have learned something, you can explain the data, the question is, is this good? And uh, we have prepared slides that discuss this evaluating effectiveness and I will explain what um, I will shortly outline. I will talk about um, the error. Um, I will talk about the statistics of the error. I will talk about how to compute boundaries to estimate how big the error in fact is. Can we tell something about this? And I will tell about if you have several different hypotheses or we say several different models, how to choose the best one. Uh, at Martin and the um, TAs, I do not see the chat at the moment. If there are questions, please tell me. Um, I'm happy to, to interrupt this and uh, to, to talk about this. Yeah? No problem. Okay. Mm. Okay. This is the definition of the true error. Um, it, uh, bef before you read this, or you can read this, it tells simply the following. Um, you have a, a set X. This is the set here, uh, sorry, the, the set of all examples. Yeah? And this uh, set X, um, I can write this down. I do this here. This set X has these, these feature vectors. Yes, X1, X2, X3, and so on. And what um, we now check is um, whether a certain feature vector is classified not correctly. Yes. Let's say x1 is not classified correctly and x3 is not classified correctly. This is in fact checked here. And the proportion of these wrongly classified examples 
compared to all examples, this is the, the true error. And we can compute this if we check each of the examples, apply our classifier here, yeah, apply it, and then look whether we get the same class at, uh, as in the reality. And um, the problem is this is, although this is the truth, the true error, we cannot compute this because we are not able to get every example, every element from X and to try this. And what we have to do is to look at a subset. Before I do this, how, um, I will also explain that the, the word is not so strict like it looks here that we classify something and we want to check a certain class. The word is more probabilistic. I will uh, explain this um, here. This is the most uh, general uh, situation. Um, you see on the y-axis uh, the number of classes yeah, here. This is uh, class one, this is the uh, class two and so on. And you see on the x-axis all our, our examples, all our elements which we want to investigate. And you see what we expressed here, these are the so-called marginal probabilities. They say the example x1, x1 is, is uh, not so often observed like the example x3. Yeah. And what you see here with the classes on the left hand side, you see that the class C2 is, is much more frequently observed in the reality than the class in C1. And uh, even more, things become more complicated if we focus, for instance, on, on this vector here, um, x1, then we see that x1 is classified in um, a certain class, namely in, in this one here. And this classification here is uh, looks unique. Yes, there's no label noise. But in practice, we have the following situation. In practice, um, we we find um, elements in the world which one person A would say this is class uh, C8 and another person would say no this is class C5. Look at the classification of the virus symptoms which we have. Uh, am I ill in fact or not? And uh, this unsecurity, the classes are not unique, a unique is expressed here. To sum up, we have a certain prior probability that we observe certain symptoms or features and we are not unique in doing class assignment. This what you see here is the most generic problem description and normally in machine learning we have it a bit simpler but this is normally always a background. We see here on the x-axis all elements with their probabilities, and you see on the y-axis possible classes. And this is such a distribution. And this is what we want to learn. Hence, our error also computes from our possibility to, to map, to model this distribution. We check, I will hint this here, all x and against all classes and look as of for each of the x in each class we are doing the right thing here. And this is um, what you see here, these uh, green points, this is uh, the, the probability. And the more intensive uh, green is, the higher is the probability. 
And uh, this indicator function here, i, tells us whether we are correct or not. And now you see something interesting. If you are wrong on examples which are really rare, this is not a problem. And if we have label noise, the class assumption is not unique. We cannot avoid doing an error here because we assign with our mapping a single class. What we do here is a true error, the probabilistic error. This is all the truths. It does not become more complicated. This is a general case. Is to sum up over all examples and all classes have the probability of the joint event that this example belongs to this class and look whether you're doing it right. And I, we will not directly map this onto exercises. Don't be afraid. But we want to present you this complex or complete picture, not complex, complete picture. If you take books in your hands, if you want to read other material because these probabilities are very often mentioned and uh, we have illustrated for you to make it easier to understand them because these probabilities are the foundations when we do uh, the machine learning with space or the machine learning in more complex settings. Here again is this uh, kind of gradient drawing of our probability space. And here we see the marginal probabilities. How often is a certain vector observed? Yeah. And here you see the marginal probabilities. How often is a certain class observed? We have often to do with class imbalance. One class is much more often observed than another. What you see here is the distribution of a certain x value giving the classes. What you see here, this is a quite important distribution, is the distribution of the class giving the x values. As you see here, that for this class, uh, it may be C8, you see that there are certain x values where it's really often and others where it's not. And um, here you see the entire picture. And these probabilities, these are used in several places. They are called joint probabilities and likelihoods and conditional probabilities. For instance, you see here there is a class condition. If I'm in this class, how are the value distributed? This is something we wanted to show you. Our learning situations are often separable classes. And um, I will show you this here. We have two classes. The class C2 here. This is, you see also this is uh, more often, there's a, is the class imbalance and the class E1, which is here. And we have a feature space in two dimensions. Each plus or minus each point in this data space is um, in observation and has a certain x value and this uh, x1 value and a certain x2 value. And then um, I've drawn a probability distribution um, again to, to show you this. For instance, in this uh, class C1, which we see here, these are all these elements. Yeah? And uh, this class C2, which we will see here, these are all these elements. And uh, you see this class C2, this is more often there. And if you build a classifier and a zero knowledge classifier, and you say simply, I always classify my examples into C2, then you do already a good job. Yeah? Because you, you have already more than 50%. Let's say if uh, C2 is 70% of all uh, 
cases and C1 is 30% of all cases, and you say only C2, your classifier has an accuracy of 70%. Isn't this crazy? With zero knowledge, yeah? only because of this distribution. This distribution can also see here, yeah, and um, on a graphical um, representation of this. And um, what we learn with our algorithm is um, this line here. Yeah, yeah, this, this is what we learn, this discrimination line. And we see also this discrimination line here. Yeah? It's the same discrimination line. In the graphic below, you see this discrimination line shown in between the different distributions. And a base learner does this. And perhaps you recall in the beginning of the, in the first lecture, I explained something of generative classification, which considers the, dis the true distributions. This is uh, what we see here. And the discriminative thing, uh, which is very simple, only tries to make some line between the two that this is here. But they, they, they belong together. And you see this here. And uh, this was something we wanted to demonstrate to you that you know this. And uh, perhaps the slides are useful for you to refer to them back if you go into more complicated literature. Okay. Let's go to estimating bounds. We back to our situation. Um, we have data, you have an idea about the hypothesis. Here, this is the, the data, we work with this, and uh, we have uh, computed a hypothesis. And uh, since the data is not complete, we have only taken a subset. We ask ourselves, can, was this good if we learned on this subset? Yeah, we have, that's, we have we got the wrong subset. This is kind of sample selection bias. You have only taken the simple examples. This is what the PhD is likely going to do, take only the easy cases. Or is the sample large enough? You yeah, yeah. have only any examples. Is this, is this good enough to learn something? But it's not good enough. Perhaps you, you need a much bigger sample. Anyway, you are asking what is the true error? The true error is what we had here. The true error is how behave, behaves your classifier, which, which is plugged in here, how behaves this in the real world. And uh, one thing is clear, you cannot test against the real world. And uh, the first message which we want to bring to you is um, there are different ways to compute such an error, and they are in a certain relation. And the, 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 we were so brave to write this relation down because this is a bit risky. What you see here, this does not always hold, but typically, yeah, this, uh, I want to emphasize this, these are things that typically hold. We have the training error, I will formalize and show you them later on, which takes all the data for training and tests and does not distinguish. We have the cross-validation error, which puts a bit of the data. Now, let's say we start here. We have the hold out error, which puts a bit of the data aside, the so-called um, test set. Yeah. And uh, we have the cross-validation error, which is a refinement of the hold out thing. And how do they relate to the true error? They are all smaller in general. In general, you do underestimation. That means in general, your results are worse than it appears to you. And we want you to learn this. Again, I want to tell you that we organize this here in the total order, these four kinds of errors. This is a bit risky because in rare cases, the true error can be even smaller than the cross-validation error also. But in general, you are worse in the reality. And this is a certain reason. 
The reason is that the, the material, the data from what you learn is only a subset of the real world and you have not enough information to, to build a good classifier. Okay. Um, I now go through the different errors. Our um, data here, this is a uh, set B. Yeah. And we use this set B completely to build a classifier of R. So it's okay, we can do this. This is a nice classifier. But what we cannot say is how good is this? What we could do is we can take this classifier now and take the data which we took here to learn from also to test this. This is a risky in such sense because the classifier has already seen every example and if the classifier for instance is a hash table, yeah, it could store each example and would perfectly do the matching and the assignment when it's presented feature vector because it's a key, it looks up in the hash table and brings the right class. That means if you use for training, this is here, the same as for test, this is here, you cannot evaluate whether you are good. Your classifier might be good. But you cannot see this anymore. In the case of the, of the hash table, your classifier does not generalize anything. It, it, it is really bad. But perhaps you can build a nice classifier. How to find this out? The training error is the error that you get. It's, it's uh, shown here. The training error is the error that you get if you Take all examples of the training set here, test your classifier, and look the proportion which you did uh, wrong. You would take your training set for evaluation purposes. This is called training error. And now you understand that um, this uh, training error is often a strong underestimation of the true error. Yes, we can do better. We can construct a hold outset. Uh, this is uh, done here. And this is again the entire set D. Yeah. And here you see a training set. Uh, um, so training set, and here you have a test set. And uh, during training, this test set is never seen. The classifier, and hence this is, I want to point this out, is uh, called Y prime here. It is not exactly Y because it's not trained on the entire set. It's only has to be trained on a subset, the so-called training set. This uh, can does not use all examples. And that example, those examples which are not used for training, they are used for test here. And uh, this brings us to the test error or the hold out error, which uh, tests our classifier. Here you see this test. And um, checks um, the portion of those elements in the test set which are classified correctly or miscorrectly. Um, looks a subtle difference that we say the hold out error of y is computed by taking y prime and testing y prime on the test set. That means uh, this um, error, this whole out error, is an 
underestimation of the error of y because y is trained on the entire data d and y prime is you tested only on the well, tested and it is trained only on the trains we can make this uh, more elaborate if training data is uh, scarce this is uh, this is the normal case here we have not a lot of uh, of data which we work with here again is our our sample then we do a so-called cross validation or a k fold cross validation that means we split our entire set d into more or less uh, similar sized uh, subsets uh, which are disjoint yeah k disjoint sets and uh, then build different classifiers we build uh, the first classifier which we call y one prime on this set this is a training set here and this is a training set for our second classifier and so on and this is the test set the training set for our case classifier and um, we can average their performance yeah? you see this here for each of these k classifiers in which we have built we average their we, we compute first their error performance yeah? the error performance of this classifier here and these classifiers here and then we, we average them we, we show this here and this this average this averaging here yeah, which happens here this is called cross validation error of y it's the average misclassification rate on the k test sets using k different classifiers and the nice thing which we can do here is that and that we can um, make the k bigger and bigger up to the number of elements in d then we have the leaf one out method so called leaf one out method and uh, we do not need to care about the size of the of the test set here and uh, this, this test set here this this can become smaller and smaller and this is a, a good thing um, to uh, do if you have not enough data However, this also comes at a price. Um, typically, this, uh, this cross validation error, you see this here, is uh, not so close as the true error, like the whole out error. If you increase sample size, and this is expressed here, if you increase sample size, until the entire set x yeah, yeah, then. then the true error becomes a training error no worries if you do not understand or can recap or recall anything what i'm talking about now and we have i've written this all on the slides for instance the last thing if d is x the true error becomes a training error there's all information in the notes which i'm skipping on the remarks The last thing we would want to show you is the idea of comparing model variants. You have developed different models, you are not sure which to choose. Again, we have a training set D, and your model, this is how we do this, they are distinguished by so called hyperparameters. Yeah. Hyperparameter could be um i have used uh, find s or i have used candidate elimination or i have used decision trees of this type or i have used a certain regularization method anyway you end up with m different models um, we call um, each hyperparameter set is it makes the model specific a pi parameter yeah? and you give um models we have m parameters and we hence build m classifiers yeah. there is a question in the chat. yeah okay thank you yes yeah. the training and testing d i mean that means i guess that means data is the same and cross validation 
wait, I go back uh, before I know. So what was the question? Is it the training? It's training and testing data the same in cross validation. Um, um, here, uh, I, will, I will show you this. This is our set B because I can misunderstand the question. This is a set B, and this is the training data for the first classifier. And this is the test data for the first classifier. Yeah? And here, this is the training data for the second classifier. And this is a test data for the second classifier. That means, uh, in that sense, they are all the same because they are all built from D. However, each classifier has a separation, the holdout thing here is uh, between training and test. The only difference to the holdout, what you see here, is that this is done several times. You look, you see here, I've, I've um, illustrated the test set only at the end, let's say in quotes, at the end of the data. Why not have taken this uh, from here? Yeah? Wait, I, I will take a, a different color. Why not taking the, the, the test data from here? Or why not taking the test data from here? Yeah. And this is what is done in, in k-fold cross validation. We, we do a cycling of this here. And uh, in fact, we can build um, exponential many sets. Yeah. And here we build only k. And uh, but you have many possibilities to do this. In that sense, I answer your question. For each classifier, the training data and the test data are different. The test data is hold out, retained. However, these different splits, these k splits, which are illustrated here, are all built from the same data set B. Does this answer your question? I try to open the question. So the it. first question was answered, but there is another one. Yeah. If the cross validation error is less than the holdout error, doesn't that mean that there is a classifier in the cross validation that performs better than the classifier in the holdout error? This is a good um, um, a question. <laughs> and I like this kind of question. Yes and no. And um, it can be that the test set was simpler. Huh? Because the test set might have had simple examples, but it could also be that the training set was better. This is not so easy to see. And as a disclaimer for this thing, which I like that we presented to you, that you have something in your hands, there's also a, a, a disclaimer which you can read here. This uh, is not straightforward, and your question can not answer it straightforward. It could be that the classifier is better. You know? And it could also be that the test set which you used for this classifier had only simple cases. And this cannot be distinguished. We only measure that the performance was better for this classifier. And uh, by averaging, by doing this cycling round, we average also these this, uh, problematic cases. And our average, <coughs> we in fact built uh, a stronger classifier. Or uh, no, no, on average, sorry, this is not wrong. On average, we built a better assessment um, of, um, of the error with small data. Um, for the moment, we are very happy if you can follow these ideas. So the slides are precise. You can um, take this formula, but it, it, the, the first purpose of this reading is to bring you an idea of what happens here. In the worst, not in the extreme case, where we use in the, in the training error, all data for training and test the same. And the, the hold error, we, we, we hide something completely. But in the first validation, we do some kind of cycling. And um, we have arranged these errors in this way because the cross validation error has more training data reserved for the classifier. And it hence is usually a bit lower than the holdout error. Don't know whether this answered the question. Um, 
the TAs, what would you say? Um, the Oscar says, thank you, so I suppose it does. Okay. Um, there is an additional question. Yeah, please. Um, are there big disadvantages in using cross well evaluation? I mean, is there a kind of redundancy in using the data for evaluation? This is also something I ask myself often. Um, in fact, uh, here we, uh, the common practice is that all people do this. And we also then do this. Um, but if I have to bet my money on this and uh, deliver a classifier uh, uh, assessment for my classifier, I, I would become more careful. I do not, uh, this advantage is um, that the, data, the, the training sets are, uh, which we use in the single classifiers are never stratified. But the, this might be averaged out. Um, to, to give you a hint, I would say there is no disadvantage at the moment. Take it, uh, if it takes a cross-validation error as a good error method to compute the error. Yeah. You see this I, is, yeah. <laughs> Michael, yeah? No, I, 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 was, I was thinking, and perhaps you can comment on that as well, the, the larger the training set we have the less problematic things get. This is correct. Yeah, yeah. This is and this is expressed by this arrow here in, in uh, here. What would you see here? Yeah, this is here. This arrow. Okay. I, I will continue, but um, I want to tell you this is this is not easy, not uh, so clearly answered stuff. And what we observe in reality is that people present on conferences fantastic results, and if you try the, the, the classifier in another setting, it completely fails. And this, this means the error which was computed, what does it tell us? Yeah? Not so easy. And uh, what we present now in this reading, this course, is to show why is this problematic, and what should you do? Mm. I go back to model variance, however, feel free to interrupt me. Um, in the model variance thing, this um, should uh, not be um, confused with, with this case here. Um, also, by cross validation, we, we built different classifiers, but they are all of the same kind. The only difference here in the cross validation thing is that they get different training sets to be specified to be um, parameterized. What we are now looking, you have two different solutions, or you are a team, and in the team, everybody came up with a classifier. And now you ask, what is the best of these classifiers? And we say for the moment here we have M classifiers because this is a standard way to write this down. And these M classifiers can be distinguished by their hyperparameter. And this hyperparameter can be this is a classifier of Pete, this is a classifier of Anna, this is a classifier of John, this is, can be anything. Yeah? And we call this classifier uh, Y pi 1, Y pi 2, and so on. And we take now one of these classifiers and train it on our data set. But which one should we take to deliver? Which would be, should we sell? Which uh, should we make active if we are Amazon and have classifiers to, to cancel out reviews that are obscene? Or we are Google and they have classifiers to, to rank. Yeah, which, which would we take? And this is a question which is answered here in comparing model variants. Um, the, the main thing what you see here is that we now have also a so-called validation set. Now this is this here. Now. And um, we start by by talking about um, our our data here, yeah. oh, this is data, our data, 
and this uh, data from this we, we retain, that means we remove, uh, test it, this is here, and um, from, from this remaining here, you can see here is, we remove also a validation set. And um, what we then do is, uh, we train a classifier um, here on, on this training set, which is now an even smaller, you see this here, yeah? and ask ourselves, how would this, this classifier on the validation set? This, this is um, what you see here. And what we now do is we do this for every of our M variants. And hence we get M classifiers here. Again, don't confuse this with a cross validation set. These are really different classifiers, all trained on the same training set. And we now compare them and are looking for that classifier, which is on this validation set, here on this validation set, the best. And if we have found this out, only then, then take this classifier and check this on the test set. And we want it not to bring in knowledge in the validation selection, and we know don't, didn't want to bring in knowledge in the test situation. And hence we have this different three sets, the training set, the validation set, and the test set. Okay, back to our training set, we have built these classifiers. you see them here, J is one to M, we have built them. And again, observe this, uh, this here, I call them prime, why? prime, because this is not the classifier that you finally deliver. This is a, only a, a, an auxiliary classifier that you build to find out how good your classifier is that you have trained on the entire set. Here we see that what I promised already, that we find out is the best classifier. Yeah. We uh, compare these errors here and we get our five star. And um, we, our best classifier that we can deliver now is this one here. This is trained on the training set B, but we train to find out how good this classifier is. We find a bit out, we train this on the test set. Uh, sorry, we train this on the D without the test set. And uh, this means we now take this classifier here and train this on this set. So, so it's not um, perfect. So we train it so on, on this set. Yeah. It means we take the validation set uh, again as part. And then we compute its error. And this is uh, compute again the holdout error here. Yeah? But uh, we have done two things. We have uh, chosen one of these um, classifiers here as our optimum classifier. And for this selection, we have used the validation set. And then we take um, again the, the training set. Uh, as in the holdout situation and compute the error of the test classifier. There's a question? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Why can we not just use, why can we not just compare using the test directly, I think, instead ah, of uh, uh, retraining? Yeah, we can do, do this, but we, uh, then we, we, we select a, a model that likes the test. Yeah, this is the point. We, uh, this, this, um, we select a model that likes the test and this model is also good in the test error later. Yeah? That means we bring already knowledge here. We would bring this here again. This is not what we want to do. 
uh, we will, would have a bias because when we use only a test set to uh, this is a good question i'll ask you this why should we need this validation test we can do this job with, with the test set yes but we then prefer a model which likes the test set. and then we take this model and do the test error. and here you see that you're doing not a good job if you, if you make this error. and hence we, we keep the knowledge from which we learn separated we take a certain kind of knowledge to find out is our uh, classifier which is the best classifier and we take a kind of knowledge out and ask how could it is could it be in the wild all what i'm telling here is the retaining of data sets need for validation of a test is only successful if you have a stratified sample that means if what you have from the distribution here follows the distribution here or back here consider this situation where we wanted to build a classifier which distinguishes between two classes if we take our uh, only um, test examples from here yeah? then we have a problem if we only take test examples from here then we have a problem our selection of test data training data and validate uh, validation data has to follow exactly i am using another color to show you this has to follow this distribution each set that we build has to follow this distribution. If we don't do this, we're doing something wrong. Perhaps this is a good way there um, to, to, to complete also this, this lecture from my side here, because what I'm bringing uh, in the last slides, which I have not shown yet, is that um, we can uh, combine um, the cost validation and the model selection so that we have um, everything varied this uh, leads to something like uh, this this k validation set it's a bit more complicated it has now a quadratic situation which you see here but um, we, we have k validation sets now and apply the idea of cost validation on model selection as well, but uh, this is uh, more canonically. Yeah. Here happens not something important anymore. Important was what I mentioned here, yeah, that, that you have every, in each uh, splitting of the sets, you have to follow the, the true distribution. And this is not so easy to do this. Yeah, I think this is all what I can tell you. Um, we, we did a lot of effort to, to make this illustration as strong and graspable as possible. We hope that you enjoy this. Um, if, if I analyze such, such uh, illustrations like this, it takes sometimes an hour or two. Don't, this is not so easily understood. And uh, you should, um, Take your time to get used to, to the data. Because actually you are confronted with this data. And you think about marginal distribution. Which feature vector comes off? Which not? You think about classes. What is the dominant class? OK, then. Um, I want to say thank you also on behalf of Martin and all the TAs who did a great job. We had the hardware problems last night and the group was very active in helping and doing this. And I'm also happy that you are interested in listening here and we, we do the best to, to give our knowledge to, to you.